Uh, Ted, do you guys, you got, what do you got going on? Uh, life has gotten confusing and I've been distracted from my high priority of radio astronomy as a hobby. So that's disappointing. Uh, but slowly I'm assembling parts to make one of these Wi-Fi gun antennas, try to make cheap antennas again. Wouldn't it be fun if I could make an array of those and have a small beam width on the sky in a cheap way? So I'm trying to outdo your scope in a box. John, Alex, uh, what do you got up to? Okay. Um, courtesy of Wolfgang, I have an, another on. telescope to add to. Oh, he is on. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Add to the data set. Let's see. We alive? I see you. Let's okay. Go. All right. So um, I'll briefly go over what I did last time. Um, so right now I have five. I have data from five different uh, radio telescope systems. They're small. They run from 1.2 mine up to 3.7 meters in diameter. Three used uh, SDR software to find radio systems, and two used the older Spectra Cyber. And these make an interesting uh, contrast. There are 24-hour uh, drift scans for about plus 40 degrees declination, and each was uh, about a four to five minute time frame, one to two, one to one and a quarter uh, degrees per slice. Okay, uh, everyone knows this, but the, I'll, there's a, this is different from what the, uh, the Spectra Cyber does in that I. A software-defined radio is like an FFT system, and um, if you process 420 seconds during, during all of those periods of 420 seconds, each channel is being averaged over that entire time period, and thus it provides pretty good statistical convergence of the, of the random data. Um, so the SDR, these were the, uh, this was a set of of data spectra from the now three radio telescopes that I were use, I was using. They differ from each other. One was uh, LSR corrected, the others weren't, but it gives you an idea that the data for all three radio telescopes is of, of good quality, good signal noise. Um, here we go. This is a comparison. This is a little different than I did last time. So this is mine. I think my measured beam width was was a closer to 20, but I don't know what the other ones are, so I pulled this off of an online calculator and it comes up 15. Um, they'll be relative to each other. The velocity distribution uh, from the frequency converted to uh, velocity is about uh, 0.6 kilometers a second, and this is sort of the beam width of my antenna. So this is a 24-hour drift scan. This is the 20, 30 hours uh, Cygnus, and this is around 05 hours RA. So this is mine. This is with Wolfgang's 2.3 meter. You can see the, uh, the beam width is much smaller. It has higher uh, resolution for frequency resolution, which is the vertical axis. And so you see mine is blurred. Mine is more dispersed. The energy is more defined and there's better resolution of the image. And this is the uh, 3.7 dish. This was actually from Charles. Um, the beam width is even smaller, and so you see greater details. And the beam width of his radio telescope is down around three to four degrees. So it's a uh, it, you can tell from using different size radio telescope dishes that you improve the quality. And I'm almost wondering if you're reaching a limit here on the ability to resolve details in the Milky Way. So we put them all together and this is what they look like. Uh, you can see, just looking at this little outer arm, this is the outer arm, this is the Perseus arm, this is the outer arm. Um, you can see the improved definition as you go to a larger dish. So the vertical axis is velocity, the, uh, the horizontal axis is uh, 
Great Ascension, his annual resolution. And so you can see it's pretty good, um, you know, qualitative analysis. But if you go to a, uh, a larger dish that you gain resolution, and here's the other side of the, of the Milky Way. There's some issues with uh, LSR correction on one of them, but it still is a, is a nice comparison of showing different telescopes and an interesting challenge for me to figure out how to read FITS files besides the output of data from the IF average software that I use. Um, quickly again, uh, spectrocybers are a step frequency uh, scanner. Um, and so if you take 240 uh, seconds of data, it steps through each channel for one second. So if you take uh, one degree of drift scan, four minutes, each frequency that you're analyzing is only is only processed for one second because it is stepping through a set of frequencies and so this is the data that you get the the signal the noise is decreased because you're not taking data for a very long period of time and the equivalent um spectra look like like the I think that's about all. Oh, this was um, last time Wolfgang made the suggestion that you can calculate the quality of the data um, by looking at the RMS noise versus peak, and that there should be an improvement uh, about proportional to uh, the square root of, of the time taken. So this is from the Spectra Cyber one second average. This is from the SDR 240 or 300. So there should be about a yeah, 15, 16 uh, times improvement in the quality of the data. Because this is mine, I think with the deep, deep dish, I came out with about 19. But it's very obvious here that the longer you sample, the better the data you get. That's my story. Any questions? All right, what's your next steps, Alex? Are you uh, need more data from anybody or uh, you want to do something I, else? I don't know. I've My software is so fragmented right now, I don't think I need any more data. I was just trying to uh, trying to evaluate what the improvement is. And uh, I think this is a fairly good illustration of what you get with different sized dishes. Very That's good. That's the story. Oh, I do, the question I have for Wolfgang is, is there not a, what is a limit on re being able to resolve H-line data? There has to be a, it's, it's like these distributed clouds that a, a hundred meter dish is not gonna give you any quality of data. It almost looks like getting into the three to four meter dish, you may be reaching a limit of no return on resolution. Well, actually, there's a, there's a quite some difference if you go to higher uh, resolution dishes. <clears throat> um, I don't have it quickly uh, at hand. Maybe I can find it while we are talking uh, today. Um, if I look at the com uh, comparison between a three our three meter dish and our twenty five meter dish, uh, when I look at the resolution of the galactic plane, that's quite a difference. And uh, really, the the best um, data that is available as of now for hydrogen it has been done by the Effetsberg telescope which is a 100 meter dish and for the southern uh, hemisphere it's the uh, dish in Australia which I believe is 76 meter dish and yes the, the uh, there are some structures which are really fairly small and fine in the hydrogen so you, you do see an improvement uh, we also see an improvement already when we go from our 2.3 meter dish, which is the data that I have sent to you, uh, versus our three meter dish. Um, let me um, try to look at my what I have available right on hand, maybe later on, to give you a comparison between uh, the resolution of the galactic plane um, on a 
three meter dish versus a 25 meter dish. And you will see a, there's a notable, noticeable difference. Be interesting. Thanks, Alex. Um, and uh, Wolfgang, now we got you on. What do you got going on? Yeah, the uh, main activity over the last uh, period of time uh, has been in interferometry. Uh, I already told a bit about that, so I, quite frankly, I do not recall what I have told and what I haven't told yet. Also in another forum where I talk about these things. Anyway, um, essentially, uh, I've, please forgive me if I'm repeating myself. Uh, we have three activities going on as far as interferometry is concerned. We are revitalizing our KU band interferometer, which is a uh, two 1.2 meter dish at KU band. Um, it's a transient uh, meridian transit instrument, so we're looking south. The status there is that uh, because it has been sitting around for a couple of years, um, we uh, uh, we have some mechanical issues there. We have some things we have to replace, so we're working on that. Um, the other thing is that we have picked up again doing interferometry between our 1.2 meter and our 2.3 meter dish. Um, we're doing ex experiments um, to learn a bit. And the third experiment is to set up a three element interferometer using very simple antennas. So that's sort of a, a plan and we're just collecting the bits and pieces and hopefully we'll have something going on. Um, that's what we are doing. Um, as far as the, let's say, the activity interferometry is concerned. Uh, what I have done, um, and that's an upcoming Zara article, uh, which I'll be sending in to you the next few days, is um, I've done a, let's say, careful analysis about the um, Pluto SDR, which can be converted to a two-channel uh, device the latest hardware version, and I've characterized it and looked at it, um, so we're using that. It's quite promising. And I put things together in the SARA article, which you'll get in the next few days. Yeah, and um, a, a bit of a side comment to David. Um, yes, he can count on me as giving for giving a presentation in April uh, via Zoom. Not sure what I'm going to talk about, but uh, certainly we'll ha I will have something to talk about. So if you can schedule me in, that would be fine. And I'll let you know what I'll be talking about somewhat later. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Appreciate it very much. OK, I, I guess that's um, a quick summary of uh, essentially what, what we are doing at the moment. Uh, I hope I can give a more uh, detailed and concise report later on uh, or in the next uh, few meetings on what the uh, let's say the findings are in our interferometry experiments. Great. Thanks, Aunt Wolfgang. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, Andrew, uh, can you give us some updates on all the stuff you've been doing? What, me? Yep. <laughs> me, Andrew? Oh, oh okay. Uh, sorry. A bit of surprise. I, I, uh... Um, I think the most exciting thing I could show, maybe, is it possible to share my screen? Go ahead. To share screen, yeah. Give me a second. I just want to show one slide, rather, which uh, I, I'm very excited about. Um, and uh, also very excited and uh, very kindly, uh, Ted, when I showed to Tim, was, oh, where do I get that graph, get that plot from so I can uh, put it on mine, uh, which was quite uh, a nice uh, nice thing to say. So uh, let me find it. Uh, hang on. And, and while you're thinking about it, since uh, you're pretty new in this group, uh, give it a little background. Uh. Oh yeah, well, I'm not only new in this group, but I'm, uh, I'm I'm very new to the whole thing of radio astronomy. I, I, I did try it about 10, 15 years ago and was incredibly unsuccessful doing things like meteor observations. Uh, but I've been off ill for quite a protracted period of time over the last few months. And it gave me an option to, uh, to revisit it, especially as the sky was so unbelievably um, so it's so unbelievably uh, cloudy all the time. I couldn't do any normal um, astronomy or what do you say, any other type of astronomy, I should say, rather than normal. Um, and uh, the so the uh, end result of that was uh, I got very excited, this, especially so I'd have some success. It was um, Lester's scope in the box that uh, 
has, or at least Lester was the one who introduced me to Scope in the Box and gave me lots of uh, help with that, which started me off. And then Ted contacted me and said, do you want to give my software a go? And it started to produce phenomenal results. And a guy called Andrew Thomas from the UK gave me this uh, uh, um, th th this ex-military array to try. And it worked. And it's got another great feature about it, which is that my wife is happy to allow it to go on the patio where she doesn't like scopes. Sorry, doesn't like dishes. Which is quite an important feature when you're a newbie starting this. So uh, I'm, I'm, can you see that picture? Yes. So, so I'm really jumping ahead of myself here, which is really uh, running before I can hobble, never mind walk. Uh, so uh, <laughs> having not even completed my mapping project, the Milky Way yet, uh, I'm trying to work out what I'm going to do next. So uh, I'm having to go at building an interferometer. So it's it's based on uh, Wolfgang and uh, some of the folks who are giving me a bit of advice. So, so in, inside that metal box at the top is one of these little H302 boards, uh, which uh, you mentioned earlier on. Which, for anyone who doesn't know, it's a um, an amplitude phase uh, contrast comparator, which, as I understand it, means you take in two signals and two SMAs, and it comes out with a single DC voltage that tells you uh, what what the phase shift is between them. And please, anybody else, do correct me on this because I really don't know what I'm talking about. So that that's inside inside that box there, which is meant to try and give some RF protection. And and then uh, I, I'm lucky enough to have a couple of lab checks around, so uh, I've got that plugged in there. Um, and uh, on the right hand side, you've got the two inputs, which have got a, uh, um, a Neulek uh, uh, low noise amplifier at the top. Um, two bias T's have got an issue there. I need to deal with them because the one doesn't cover the frequency ranges about it. And then I'm just <laughs> the, the the best well. It's an attempt to try and narrow the wavelength a bit, but those two uh, white things uh, nearest the um, silver box are uh, um, further uh, filters, because they, uh, uh, which could take down to about 50, um, 50 megahertz, I think it is. Is it 50 megahertz? Yeah, 50 megahertz, I think, around the hydrogen um, um, hydrogen frequency, 1,400 to 1,420. Um, the, just to say that uh, the other side of the the LANAs, yeah, the low noise amplifiers at the end, the new electric devices, there's going to be in first instance five meters of coax that's going to go out to um, a, a couple of dishes, which I can temporarily put outside rather than long term, um, and and they're going to have uh, new electric uh, um, one thousand four hundred and twenty uh, filters, cascaded amplifier things. The uh, was it sorry the the, uh, the sawbird plus H1Ms, which I think are amazing, uh, on the end of those. So hopefully, fingers crossed, I might be able to get a signal from the sun, which is where I'm going to start. Let's see if I can get uh, um, uh, some sort of interferometry uh, uh, fringes appearing. And uh, it'd be nice to know if somebody thinks that is actually practical or not. And that's me finished. How do I finish up shop sharing? There we are. Great. Any questions on how we design that? No, it looks like yeah, you know, looks like the box that he's using there. Uh, looks like it may be a, a it started life as an electrical junction box for house wiring. Is that correct? It, well, yeah. Well, well metal uh, component boxes in the UK are about like twenty pounds plus for that sort of size. And I was popping into a local hardware store, and I uh, I found one of those for one pound sixty, which seemed a, a good repurposing exercise. Uh, uh, and uh, people have commented that I need to have. A, a lid on it so underneath it there's some uh, silver aluminium foil sort of kitchen variety which is underneath everything and then the two are connected together by uh, uh, a bit of connection wire the two sawbirds are there just temporarily you're going to actually move them to the feeds of the antennas Th those aren't sawbirds. The, the sawbirds are, are, are on the other side. They're going to be on the feeds. To I think it was yourself, Alex, that suggested that. that that's exactly where they're going to be. Those just happen to be two other um, uh, filters with a slightly narrower uh, range. I mean, uh, Wolfgang's already told me that uh, in a perfect world, you'd have three megahertz. Well, you can't really buy for any decent price three megahertz. But I've got uh, a, um, I think I think it's one of the members here that's doing a kindly offer to do a, a um, online meeting with me on Tuesday and I I'm going to get some instruction on how I go about making an interdigital uh, filter and have a go at doing one of those. May or may not work, but the whole point of this is the fun of trying to do it. 
All right. Well, glad to have you on here. Uh, really, uh, this is fun stuff you're doing. I mean, no, nobody's, made, no, nobody's made any comments there. I mean, please make some comments. Constructive criticism is uh, is absolutely accepted. Just talk with it, please, in in words of absolutely one syllable, because most of what's been discussed this evening has gone straight over my head. So, so keep it very, very simple. And I really don't mind. Um, yeah. any Andrew, you ideas. also uh, you also shared some nice drift scan data uh at 1420 looking across the sky and you were finding some uh bumps uh some peaks for energy right where the galaxy is so that's kind of a neat plot too oh do you want me to show that now with the green sure. lines yeah okay uh right um, do, 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 do. where's my data gone that is the number one question of all of us where do we hide our data when we get it i found it now <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was trying to find a minute ago. EZ uh, RA Suite, one of the most marvelous bits of software for the beginner that uh, I think could possibly be done. Um, the uh, so, so my data here is so this is to, uh, so trying to map out the galactic arms with uh, with with a relatively minimal amount of data I've got, which is at this point was only about four data points. Uh, I mean, I mean the drift scans for a, usually do forty eight hours at a time um, on my kit to try and get a a full drift scan of the sky and, and obviously there's no automation here i think just pointing in a particular direction um so uh the, the, ignore the if, if you if you ignore this this gray uh picture of the milky way there the rest of it is what uh easy ra produces i should say it's a ra rather incredible plot but of course it doesn't really give you that idea of where it is in the milky way so uh, i found a a diagram of wikipedia which is quite nicely laid out from above um I've tried to fiddle with it to try to beat copyright a bit. So I've taken the color out and tried to change it. I don't know whether I've succeeded or not. But uh, you can uh, you can see there that it, it demonstrates for you where the, uh, you know, which of the arms the Milky Way is following, which I think is very exciting. Just worth to say that yellow is the position of the sun. I'm looking at your pictures in the bottom. Uh, if we move over to two to the green line one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I quite like these. The, these are... Uh, really give you an idea of uh of where the data is actually uh, hitting the milky way Looks so to me you're like slowly it. collecting different elevations um yep. and grab grabbing that data and then trying to plot the galactic arms using all this good stuff because you are intersecting the galactic plane at different places sure neat it has begun <laughs> with, with your help more than with your help, with you holding my hand all the way, I should say. But I'm, it's, it's just incredibly exciting stuff. I just never thought I'd be able to do anything like this. Bear in mind, everybody, I don't understand most of this at all. Um, I may have a, uh, you know, a, a sort of a, a radio uh, um, code M6THO, but it's only mm. the foundation exam in the UK, and it never really actually taught me anything much about radios. Or, or the, uh, the radio observations of the Milky Way. So um, it's, it's, I've been able to produce this without that knowledge. And I know that Alex and I have had a, a lot of chats, and, and he's quite rightly pointed out that things could be improved dramatically. But as I say, the really exciting thing here is that I'm in the middle of a town. Um, we, we have loads of uh, radio frequency interference. I've got a very small garden. I'm uh, having to get permission from my wife to make sure the stuff can be used. Um, and my knowledge is very limited. And, and uh, in spite of that, I'm getting some very exciting data, and I will be then going back to it to try and improve it. And, and to max. And Alex has already offered very kindly to help me to to maximise my equipment and get it up to as good as it can be. And I will be doing that, taking up on that off, and come back to him when I finished my uh, this first mapping exercise, so I can just show that I've done it. Because there's, there's nothing like having something great like this coming out to really encourage a newbie with little knowledge to carry on in a hobby. Well, it's excellent stuff. I really like what you're doing there. Yeah. So, so uh, anything else on here? I got. Oh, this is one I'm trying to sort out. Uh, we were talking Ted and I earlier on about trying to produce a galactic plot because Easy RA will, but uh, to show the a rotation curve, uh, I'm not quite in getting there. But apparently, I've got to do some changes and uh, and fiddle with it a bit. But uh, that's what I'm hoping as well to produce out of this, a, a rotation curve to demonstrate the, the dark matter. There we are. I'm, I'm finished now.
right? <clears throat> All right, any more questions, anybody? All right. And uh, uh, Rich, if I may, um, I would like to come back to one of the questions that Alex had. I, in the meantime, I found something that maybe demonstrates. Um, let me just go and share my screen. Uh, okay, let me get that into somehow into full screen mode. 25 meter mitt. <laughs> okay. Um, Alex was asking, can you inc uh, increase resolution by going to larger dishes or have reached the limit? And this is a demonstration of the same uh, kind of uh, scan. It's a scan uh, through the galactic plane. So it's an active scan going from galactic longitude from the galactic center all the way to, in, the, in this case, 160 degrees galactic longitude. And this is a one-to-one -one comparison between a three meter dish and a 25 meter dish. So you do see that there's a lot of more structure that you can resolve when you go to a larger dish. And of course, if you go to uh, Effelsberg with its 100 meter dish, it gets, it gets even more uh, detailed. So there, yeah, there's a, quite some structure in there, and you don't resolve it with a small dish. Thank you. Uh, I've never seen that before. Yep. Um, and just uh, uh, no, one of the things I, I forgot to tell um, about the things that we are doing for the last couple of days, uh, we did an observation of uh, the Galaxy M82. Uh, the reason was that there was a I think it was on Friday, um, there was a gamma rays burst uh, observed by several uh, satellite instruments in the gamma ray and X-ray from what is considered to be a magnetar in M82. And the question was, um, would there be a radio pulse after that? And uh, we've been observing that. Um, we got the notice early on Saturday, so we immediately uh, swung over the telescope to M82. Um, I don't know yet. Uh, we have collected some 36 hours of data, uh, but it's still in the processing pipeline, so we have to find out whether there's a uh, radio pulse which follows the gamma ray burst. So we have to find it's It's kind of exciting, interesting. Probably nothing will come out of it, but... Uh, we gave it a try. Okay, that's uh, just another update. Thanks very much. Um, Wolfgang, before you get off that uh, little training session, is the um, the the different colors, obviously the red's the uh, highest intensity. Do you consider that, uh, are those hydrogen clouds uh, associated with the arms or what's causing, what's causing those uh, bright spots in, uh, in that picture? Well, it's it's uh, all in the galactic plane. Uh, so you're just sort of going in the galactic plane, and there are just areas where uh, you have substantially more hydrogen in, in towards that direction. Um, also, it has something to do how far is it spread out in velocity. For example, you have a wide spread here, and it's getting narrower here. Um, it, um, we have some other data which I couldn't find quickly, which which goes further out. If so, if you go to 180, um, all the velocities go down to zero. So all the hydrogen that you're seeing is at the same velocity, and that's another bright spot. But it's <laughs> how how is the um, hydrogen distributed in, along the galactic plane and the various uh, uh, arms? Obviously, the, the arms with the lowest velocity, that's the arm that's closer to us. And these are the other arms. Yeah, that's, that's I hope, sort of an answer to your question. Moving away from us um, <laughs> is red shifted. Moving towards us is blue shifted. And the convention is that moving away from us, red shifted is positive numbers. Okay. Yeah, OK. So if I, if I started the other way around, that's uh, just uh, Forget about it.
All right. A negative frequency shift is a positive velocity. The um, if it's a lower frequency, it is redshifted, and it is a pos positive velocity. Okay. I right. hope I'm not confusing things again, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's good. And this is a, when you start, everybody starts playing with rotation curves and things like that. Uh, it's, it's really good. Okay. Yeah, actually, this is what you would deduce the right rotation curve on. So you always take the maximum velocity. And um, that's, by the way, is something why you would typically see something different with a large dish because with a, uh, it's also demonstrated here for a small dish, you would see only that, but in fact, there's a low intensity area around here. So if you take the rotation curve, uh, the answer close to the galactic center is the answer is a bit different because with a small dish, you don't see that here. Hmm. Right. Nice. Well, that brings up another issue. Um, so close to pointing towards the galactic center, that would be on the left of these graphs. Uh, right. We don't see much hydrogen, but golly, you know, that's the galactic center. Shouldn't we see all kinds of emission from hydrogen out there? Uh, yeah, is actually, it hydrogen that I mean, is not of the right form and therefore it's not transmitting at 1420? No, you, you do see a lot of hydrogen there. The only thing is that you see the hydrogen basically at... Uh, low velocity and you don't see the high high intensity or the high uh, velocity part but you do obviously you do see a lot of hydrogen emission close to the galactic center definitely you're just yes. saying it's not moving in along our line of sight so it's at zero it's uh it's at zero in the high velocity part um that is also there um that you would typically see only with a larger dish. You can see this, this fairly low intensity part here, which sort of is not visible on a three meter dish. So if you plot the galactic rotation curve, what you will see is from going from the galactic center, a steep increase in, in the velocity. And you don't see that steep increase. You have a gradual increase. And then at, let's say from, from as you can see here, from about 20 degrees galactic longitude onwards, you're essentially seeing the same thing. You get the same rotation curve, but close to the galactic center. The, the three meter dish would not reveal the real reality, the full reality. But then having said that, it doesn't change the overall picture because if you evaluate uh, the fact that um, if you plot the uh, galactic rotation curve, you see that the velocity remains almost constant uh, all the way through uh, the 90 degrees, roughly. That remains the same. So you can get the basic message that the velocity of the rotation velocity of the galactic uh, of our galaxy does not change uh, towards the outer part of the galaxy. You get the same answer with a 25 meter dish or a three meter dish. You can demonstrate it with both. And that shows that we have more mass in the galaxy than we have visible mass. And therefore, yeah, well, that's the that's the basic idea behind it. Like in our galaxy and essentially in all other galaxies is what you see that the velocity does not, the rotational velocity does not change uh, essentially as you go out, which means that there needs to be much more mass than uh, you can deduct from just the visible uh, stars and so on. That's the big mystery of... Uh, the what they say is the dark matter all right well since i have you here let me probe you a little bit further in the very top left of these charts there is a faint high velocity away from us what is that uh, stuff? is that just you, swirling I, around the galactic center no, no not yeah. that noise even higher you know your your arch all, all the way up to 200 up in the corner uh, on on a twenty five meter dish. Yeah, so something must yeah, be moving that, away from us at a great speed. It's moving, it's moving towards you. Yeah, it's moving towards you, and that's part of uh, 
the uh, things that are close to the galactic center. They, um, it is, uh, let's see. Um, well, now you changed your answer again because you said the positive was uh, red shifted. Now yep. you're saying it's blue shifted. Okay. Moving toward us, it's blue shifted. <laughs> so this this one is red shifted. Okay, it's moving away from us at high, high speed. So it's moving away from us. Okay. So and something at the galactic center, from our point of view anyway, is moving away from us at a great speed. Uh, is that just spinning around the galactic center? Yeah, yeah. The, the idea is um, that... Let, let, let me put it this way. If our galactic, if our Milky Way would be a, just like, would be a wheel, so everything would be rotating at the uh, same angular velocity. That would mean as you go out, the uh, velocity would increase. So same angular velocity, but the, velocity around the circle, it gets higher and higher and higher. This is what, what a wheel means. Obviously, that doesn't happen in our uh, Milky Way. It doesn't happen in our uh, solar system, because as you go out, things rotate slower. But in the very um, close vicinity of the galactic center, the idea is it's just moving just like a, a fixed wheel. So as you move out from the galactic center, the uh, velocity, the angular velocity remains the same. Hence, the circular velocity increases quickly because it's heavily gravitationally coupled. So it's just like a uh, fixed wheel. And that breaks apart very soon as you move away from the galactic center. This is what I believe is the explanation of the very high velocity. So it's you move away from a galactic center, but still gravitationally strongly coupled, and it's just behaving like a fixed wheel. And that breaks apart then as you move away from the galactic center. I, I think of an atom having electrons spinning around it, and they're all in kind of a random direction all the time, kind of like a swarm of bees buzzing around something in the middle. And I think that's what's happening kind of towards the galactic center that we have such a mass in the center that things are uh, orbiting is the correct word, zooming around that galactic center. And some of them happen to be coming uh, away from us at a great speed, therefore giving us a number up north towards 200 at the top of your graph. Well, if you think about of a, let, let's think about of a fixed body, uh, Let's take the Earth. Earth is rotating. And um, everything, because it's a fixed mass, um, the angular velocity is the same everywhere. But the circular velocity increases as you move away from the center of the Earth. So the surface of the Earth is rotating at a higher speed, circular speed, than something which is closer to the Earth center. And the same is happening in our galaxy. The, the very inner part behaves just like a quasi-solid body because it's heavily gravitationally coupled. And that's as, as uh, the angular velocity is the same, the circular velocity increases very quickly, very rapidly as you go away from the galactic center. And then the gravitational coupling breaks apart and then it behaves more like a... Uh, like a solar system where everything is uh, rotating at a different angular speed and uh, essentially uh, by the by the Newton law of gravitation it's uh, rotating at the speed where it's supposed to be uh, according to the gravitational forces I'm not very good ex at explaining that because I I wasn't prepared to explain that, so I don't have any graphs, but that's that's the basic <laughs> idea. Think about that the very inner part of our, of our galaxy moves just like a fixed body, heavily gravitationally coupled. Very good. Thank you for your comments. I'm going to think about this a little, ponder a bit, try to burn it in my brain. Okay. Well done. 
Thanks. Didn't mean to have you give a lecture, uh, but that's okay. That's good stuff. Um, all right, let's go to our other UK uh, personality, <clears throat> uh, Peter. And I don't know if you're how close you are to Andrew. Yep. Hi there. Hello, everybody. Yeah, I've, I've been, as you know, I've written a couple of articles on the radiometer equation, um, and they've been published in the journal. And uh, I've moved on from there because in the last paper, um, I discovered that by putting a quarter wave transformer, in the simulating it in uh, my receiver, I could improve the uh, lower the noise quite considerably. Um, uh, do you want me to talk about it a bit more? It's go for it. Okay. Well, um, I first of all had a look at the double the the double whammy of the radiometer equation. Uh, basically, what it is, is that if you have any attenuation in the antenna receiver path, then <clears throat> the attenuation reduces the signal level that you expect from the antenna. Uh, but in addition to that, the loss produces as an, a noise component, it generates noise. And in fact, if you have 3 dB loss, then it generates 150 degrees uh, Kelvin of noise. And um, <clears throat> so uh, in, in looking into that, it made me uh, dig a little bit deeper because um, the, the, the double whammy of the radiometer equation is valid. And the, the, the problem comes in uh, you can understand attenuation producing noise, uh, but it's much more difficult to understand how mismatch produces noise. And, and in fact, what I found out was that it's only the resistive mismatch that produces noise. Uh, the reactive mismatch actually reduces the available power from the antenna. And, and and it doesn't produce any noise. Uh, so basically, uh, a complex mismatch uh, affects the signal power, um, but it's only the resistive component that generates excess noise. Um, and the way I discovered that was by, um, in uh, my receiver system, <laughs> Uh, my antenna had a impedance of 62.5 ohms and the um, and the low noise amplifier I used was a, a, a mini circuits amplifier uh, and looking up the details it had an impedance of around about 32 ohms and uh, minus 15 um, degrees of reactive noise, uh, reactive ohms. And uh, so I, uh, I I worked out all the uh, components from uh, from basic noise theory. Uh, but because the antenna was above 50 ohms and the um, low noise amplifier was below uh, 50 ohms uh, to improve the match I thought of using a quarter wave transformer uh, now you all know that a quarter wave transformer the product of the source and load impedances uh, equals the line impedance so uh, you can transform effectively transform 31 ohms to about 70 ohms which was pretty close to 62 and a half ohms. And I, I only put it in the appendix of the last paper I wrote, uh, but basically it almost zeroed the um, mismatch noise. So, uh, and so it, it 
reduced that completely. So it, it seemed to improve the overall uh, noise performance of the of the system. So uh, following that, I thought, well, you know, the ideal thing is, and probably this is what the professionals do, is that they measure their antennas, they measure the low noise amplifier, and they design a zero loss or a very low loss matching circuit between the two to optimize the performance and get rid of all of the um, mismatch noise. Um, but because I was so successful with my quarter wave transformer, I thought I'll write a program that uses the um, transmission line equations um, to see what happens when you vary the length of line. So, you know, the conventional wisdom is that you put your low noise amplifier and bolt it straight onto the antenna. Um, but I found that pulling the quarter wave transformer in, which is a quarter wave length, uh, um, my operating frequency was 600 megs. So a quarter wave would be um, 60, say 25 centimeters, or so uh, 12 and a half centimeters. So it's not long, doesn't put in a lot of uh, loss, but it uh, did improve the match. So anyway, I wrote this computer program and found out that it almost, that if there were, was reactant, rea uh, reactants, but, um, ohmic value in the low noise amplifier and the antenna, it didn't matter what it was, I could always find a length of transmission line up to half a wavelength that would virtually null the mismatch noise. So that's uh, the paper that I'm writing now. And I'm going to include the um, uh, the program in it so that people can use it themselves. There are devices on eBay that you can measure your low noise amplifier, you can measure your antenna, and you can work out exactly what the um, complex impedances of both of them, it's S11, and uh, then using my program, you can work out the length of transmission line, either 50 ohms or 75 ohms, whatever's available, and um, put this length in and zero out the mismatch noise. There's nothing you can do with the uh, attenuation noise. That's that's always there. Uh, but in a well-designed circuit, even with, say, a half a wavelength of cable, uh, you ought to be able to keep the loss down uh, below 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a dB, um, which is only about um, 15 to 20 degrees of, of, of noise. Uh, now I can show you the result of the program if you'd like to see it. It's a bit complex. Uh, can I share my screen? Go ahead. Yeah. My first question, Peter, is what is this uh, conversion uh, transformation that you have to match? Is it just a length of cable? Just a length of cable, yeah. Ooh la it's... la. So we may have been putting in the wrong length of cable in the first place. Almost certainly, yeah. If you yeah. use any length of cable, uh, let me share my screen. And of course, at and... fourteen twenty, the dimensions go even down farther, so smaller. So uh, this is the. Uh, can you see that? Not yet. No. Nope. Uh, can you see my screen now? There it is. Yeah. Yep, you've got it. Okay. <laughs> Well, basically, you've got an antenna, um, a loss between the antenna and low noise amplifier. The am low noise amplifier has got an input impedance. The antenna has got a, a complex impedance. And uh, it, with the attenuation, uh, the uh, impedance 
and with a transmission line, um, you, it looks complicated, but you can work all of this out. Uh, the reflection coefficient is uh, what you know. The attenuation is given by the the loss and the low noise and the temperature of the low noise amplifier is given by the standard FRIS formula. And this is the radiometer double whammy formula. Um, the attenuation and mismatch noise affect the signal and the cosmic microwave background, the sky and spillover. Uh, but on the right hand side, we have the, this is the noise component that's generated by the attenuation and the mismatch noise. And what I'm saying is that by correctly matching, you can make the um, the, the uh, reflection coefficient zero, because you can match effectively, use the transmission line to match it. And, uh, and so all you're left with is one minus A times the ambient temperature as the, the noise term. Um, and uh, you can use a device like this to measure the antenna. And that gives you here the, uh, the resistance, the resistance and the reactance. Uh, th this isn't the frequency I'm using, uh, but it does show the resistance and reactance. And my mini circuit amplifier has a resistance of 31.8 ohms and minus 13.5 uh, negative uh, reactants. And the antenna actually had 62 and a half uh, ohms resistive and 20 ohms reactive. And so this is a, a uh, gives a VSW of 1.8 to 1. This gives a VSW of 1.5 to 1. Now, both of those VSWs are quite acceptable in the microwave field. Uh, so the way ahead, I said, was either to design a low noise magic circuit to match these two, which you can do, can be done. You can use a Smith chart or something like that. Or in my case, I've used the transmission line equations to calculate the optimum length. And uh, these are my uh, basic figures. The loss I have is 0.2 of a dB, uh, which results in 13 degrees of K. The low noise amplifier mini circuits is 0.4 of a dB, giving 28 degrees. The sky and cosmic microwave background, I've assumed, is 15 degrees, and spillover of 20 degrees. And this is the result of <coughs> my uh, Python program. And <coughs> basically, at the bottom, we've got the transmission line length and I'll describe what these are. But in all of these three cases, it's the uh, transmission line wavelength. And if we jump back right to this end one, I've produced a signal to noise ratio figure of merit. And from this, you can see that um, it, it peaks up and the peak in this case is quite broad. So we could have a transmission line of anywhere between 0.3 and 0.4 of a wavelength, and it would be you'd have a significant improvement. You'd have a significant improvement. Now this point here is zero. This is effectively the zero point is connecting your amplifier directly to your antenna. So if you look at this signal to noise figure of merit. This is round about 0.3, this is 0.6. So you can get a 3 dB improvement just by insensitivity. This is signal to noise ratio, just by putting in the right length of our transmission line. If we go on to this one, the, the red curve is the available power. <clears throat> because we've got reactants, <clears throat> And as you change the line length, it effectively changes the reactance 
that is reflected from the load. So uh, you can reach a point, and, and what happens here is you reach the point where the reactance of the line balances the reactance of the uh, the antenna. Okay. So this is the available loss, the the red curve. The green curve is the curve you get from uh, using the return loss of the the whole uh, circuit. So this is the figure that the that goes into that people normally put in to the uh, radiometry equation, and you can see that the uh, the there's a, a a loss factor here. The blue curve is the resistive component of the um, uh, of using the transmission line. And you can see that the resistive component peaks up to almost one uh, in these two cases. And that's what's responsible for these, these peaks. So this, the blue curve is the resistive loss. The green curve is the loss that the return loss the complex return loss figure gives you. And they're balanced by the available power. Now, the available power changes because this is where the reactance is reflecting the energy back out of the antenna out into space. And the green curve is the product of the red and the blue curves. Okay, so the red curve is the reactive loss that's transmitted out into space. The blue curve is the resistive loss. <clears throat> um, the center one tells you the, um, uh, the, the actual uh, degrees Kelvin that the loss gives you. So connecting your amplifier directly with uh, this is the the brown curve is with um, uh, what is it is with the green curve is with spillover loss uh, the brown curve is with the 0.2 dB Kelvin loss and so this um, th this is the best you can do with no spillover and no other losses. I shouldn't have put those in, they're a bit confusing. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that's what the uh, program is going to tell you. As I say, I'm writing the paper now and I'll submit it to Rich later and um, you'll be able to look at that in a bit more detail. But hopefully uh, this Python program uh, if you're prepared to do the measurements, then whatever system you've got, you'll be able to optimize it. Uh, now, this is just using these figures here. Basically, I can put in any figures I like, and I always find that I've, I've always found all the figures I've used uh, show a significant improvement from the zero length connecting it directly. So that's about it, Rich. Fascinating stuff, Peter, thank you. Um, I'm curious about the figure of merit on the right. Uh, do we know if the maximum is rather a flat peak always, uh, or is it going to be a real spike from time to time? No, no, no I have found it, it can be a spike. If um, the, I, I, I think if these impedances are very close, uh, so it doesn't need matching anyway, um, I have seen some uh, really very mm. narrow spikes. 
Uh, but it's something you can do, you know. If, if you know, I I guess, uh, you know, when the good weather comes back again, I can try this out on my own system. Um, but you can, uh, <clears throat> since most cables have got a velocity factor anyway, um, it won't be exactly. You won't cut it exactly to whatever figure this says. You'll probably cut it short and maybe add a, a couple of connectors onto the end uh, to get it to the right sort of length. But as you can see here, um, there's quite a wide range uh, from 0.2 of a wavelength to 0.4 of a wavelength. In my case, that still gives you a significant improvement from connecting it directly. And, and that's why know, I bring it up. That seems to give me hope. Uh, could I have a toolkit <laughs> of several different cables of different lengths up to half a wavelength in theory? Um, perhaps thinking about the um, transmissions wavelength, uh, yeah. or <clears throat> what is it? Uh, anyway, uh, that the electrical wavelength. Correct. There we go. Um, <clears throat> and just pop them in and do a test and see if one of them improves see if i get lucky uh if with a broad peak like that uh i have a better chance of uh hitting pay dirt and improving things i know the impedance of uh of everything up to the uh up to the amplifier because i measured it yep and I kind of wonder if I could do my experiment just with a bunch of combination of adapters, for example, which are so quick and uh, rather <laughs> standard. And I, I wonder, hesitant. is a connector the same as a cable? No, well, I, the connectors aren't. It depends. You can buy connectors from eBay and you'll find they may have 0.1 of a dB loss. They might have a BSWR or 1.2. 1.3 themselves so you've got to be really careful with connectors yeah um, it, it, you know it, especially it, best ones if eBay. you were really confident you'd get a professional <laughs> company to build you a cable of the right length um but it depends what you know, and if you <clears throat> you know i was driven to this because i found that my low noise amplifier had 13 and a half ohms of reactive um impedance and and that caused me a bit of consternation because I've, I've always assumed that and i think everybody does assume that um everything is 50 ohms um even though it's got a vswr of 1.8 um you still think that it's probably really 50 ohms but it's not it's 30 ohms and it's it's this impedance over quite a wide range of frequencies because the amp low nose amplifier I'm using is very wide band. The other thing is is that the noise figure that the manufacturers quote is measured in a fifty ohm system, and I put my amplifier in a. 62 and a half ohm system so the noise figure isn't going to be 0.4 db it's going to be something else um but the the cable that you put in to match it will improve the match that the amplifier sees and maybe it's it'll be closer to 50 ohms i don't know i haven't i can um i can see that in my uh, program can I make a comment here? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I had started playing with uh, gas fed preamps for uh, 432 megahertz ham use uh, back in 1990 frame, time frame, and you had the MGF 1400 seemed to be a common uh, FET use. And those, mm -hmm. they were tuned for best noise figure. Uh, they had an input impedance far away from 50 ohms. Uh, yeah, you know, that uh, and later uh, design FETs have uh, gotten much better in that respect. But it had 
a pretty large amount. And if you tune the preamp for best noise figure, measure the gain, and then tune it for maximum gain, you'll find you get almost another 2 dB gain in some cases by uh, you know tuning for gain rather than noise figure. Yeah. So that mismatch is almost essential for making some of those early FETs work properly. Yeah. Uh, but I think manufacturers, when they sell a component, the noise figure that's measured is at equivalent to 290 degrees and in a 50 ohm system. That's the figure that Mike Midi Circuits gave me. I haven't actually measured it myself. Uh, maybe just just a practical experience that we had. Um, some of you may recall that we received uh, low noise amplifiers, uh, which replaced our original noise noise amplifiers. And just looking at the noise figure data, um, we would have expected less of improvement. But actually, when we got the new uh, amplifiers from Santa Wine Um uh, the improvement was not much larger than expected. And I think uh, one of the things or points that he made was that the matching circuit at the input was very important to uh, get that specific improvement. So really uh, getting the right matching, the complex matching is a, seems to be an important point. And uh, yes, Peter, you are right. When you get buy in a component, they measure the noise figure in a 50 ohm system. And that is not necessarily reflecting the actual reality that you have when you connect an antenna. Yeah, I, I'll make a comment too. That and like if you look at many circuits on many of their components, you'll see that they also offer you a, a PC board layout for an example of how to use the part. And that I believe typically is what they've used to make their measurements. They put the part on that board and made those measurements. And so then you've introduced the connectors and the strip line that connects up to the part and the effects of the PC board that oh, wow. have to be considered in it as well. So that's the way they made their measurements. And if you go off and do something entirely different, then you're going to get different results. All right, any other questions for Peter? Can't wait for that paper, Peter. <laughs> I'll right. work on it. Thank you very much. I get one of our other uh, um, time zone uh, challenged people, Robert Lucas. Are you back in uh, Australia? Or are you still in uh, San Francisco last time we talked to you? No, Rich, I've actually returned to Sydney. I'm back okay, here. Sydney. Yeah. Uh, and I thought I thought I missed it by an hour when I, you know, logged on about a quarter to six, and you guys were just chatting away. So I'm going to try something today, and and I hope it doesn't, you know, crash on me the way it did the last time. Okay, the last time you made a comment about, you know, about this annular solar eclipse that I went to. So what I did was, um, you know, I said, well, I'll try something, and we'll see if this works. So I'm going to try and share my screen and see how bad this goes. So bear with me, and then at the end, we'll talk about what I've been doing. So here we go. Not much related to things before, uh, and people can really laugh at me for asking them, so I do apologize. Uh, the first question is, um, in, uh, um, you know, we've been talking about uh, the the benefit of much larger dishes, like a 25 beta dish. Well, when you're doing astrophotography, which I, I know a little bit more about, not a great deal, but a little bit more about than radio astronomy, um, you can mimic the effect of a of a large telescope by integrating data over a, a long period of time, which you, you all stack. Is that something that's possible to do in, in radio astronomy? I mean, can, can we, for example, uh, do two or three years of data collection on the Milky Way and get the effect of a much bigger dish being used for that purpose. Maybe I can answer that. It's uh, there are two effects that a larger dish has. One is sensitivity, and the other one is resolution. Yes, you can increase the sensitivity with longer integration times. It's uh, the signal to noise ratio increases with the square root of the uh, observation time. So 
and sometimes we use that quite a bit that we take two hours on one spot of the sky to take a spectrum of a very weak source. But what it does not change is the spatial resolution. So, so, so if it was if possible get... to create a uh, an interferometer using very small dishes, yes, that's like something the that one meter do size, it. then you yeah. could use integration over a long time period to actually achieve the effect of a much bigger dish. Yeah, in uh, the resolution you can increase with interferometry by having multiple dishes uh, at sufficient spacing. That will increase your your uh, resolution, your spatial resolution. And the other thing is to do use longer integration time, which doesn't change your resolution, but it changes your sensitivity. And actually, that's uh, really the way the modern uh, telescopes are going, like the uh, SKA, where they're put in many dishes of a moderate size and uh, have just many of them spaced apart so they can get the resolution. All right. Okay. So the before Robert starts, then, the, the second... Uh, and probably even sillier question then, thank you very much for that response, is um, talking about matching the uh, the aerial and the low noise amplifier. Well, obviously a complicated way of doing this, as Ted was alluding to, is, is trying to uh, work out the exact length and all that stuff. But it would be so much simpler if it was possible to just pull a lever and, or, uh, or something and just see at what point the, the signal was better on your screen. Um, and it, is there any way of, of achieving that, either by having some sort of variable length coax cable that you could just turn a knob and it gets longer or shorter, or, or, or a, a circuit which you can put in at the end, which does the same effect? Yeah, at half frequency, they make uh, devices. They, they're like kind of like a trombone that you can tune for length, like you're talking about, to match, like if you're doing phase matching or other matching you need to make, you could do that type of thing and do what you're talking about oh wonderful so is that something that uh, an amateur could easily make at home because when we talk about one uh 1420 megahertz uh i mean what is that about i don't know how many centimeters but a a half um a quarter, it's between a quarter and a half wavelength b and is that something you could put into a trombone device and then just turn the knob and see what happens i would think I that you could easily. make an lc circuit for matching uh, just like we have antenna tuners in ham radio. Uh, but at higher frequencies, it gets exciting. By which I interpret gets difficult. Uh, By the way, uh, trombone, enough difficult uh, that I would not try it. Go ahead, please. <laughs> By the way, on a trombone type of device, you have a sliding contact. And that's where your problem is. You need a sliding contact that has virtually no resistance. So that means parts need to have just the right spring tension and silver plated, or it's going to be uh, lossy and erratic. Ah, so in that case, it's not really possible to do that suggestion. Well, thank you very much. Okay, Robert, we see your screen. So, um, are you... so are you seeing the Jansky antenna? Yep. Yeah. We're seeing. Okay, uh... We're seeing an aerial photograph equal. says Jansky antenna right in the middle. Yeah. Um, back back in 2012, I went to this antenna and I, with luck, you'll come up with this picture. Oh, this is ridiculous now. Now you get to see my password. It's a bunch of circles. I don't know where the circle symbol is. So what this thing is supposed to do, anyway, I went to see an annular eclipse, solar eclipse at the Jansky. Okay, and you can see off in the, uh, you know, off in this, there's the, one of the antennas. So this was, uh, you know, uh, one of the sunsets and hopefully I got what they call a green, a green flash. So what this does is, I used a, a, a better fil filter and it's supposed to, you know, increase the uh, the resolution, but you can see I'm out of focus because when I changed the filter, everything changed. So this is what the uh, the annular solar eclipse from the Jansky was looking like. And what everybody wants to see is they like to see the bathing speeds. Okay, so I thought I'd show a couple pictures of this.
and you can see some clouds came through at the end. So now if things work, we can go back here. Now if I push this button, okay, we went to, this is in the middle of Australia, and this is a uh, another annular solar eclipse that I went to. And this was early in the morning, and this is what sunrise looked like. Now, it really, you know, seemed very disappointing at the time, and we're thinking, well, they're not going to be able to see it. But uh, you know, it got a little bit darker, and all of a sudden, you know, there's this bright spot as the sun pops up. And here's what the you know the sunrise looked like underneath the clouds. Sun comes up through the clouds. And you can just yeah, on that one back there, you, you can just see, you know, just to see a little bit of a bite in it. Okay. Through the clouds, there's you know, partial solar eclipse, more partial. Oh, and here's what the you know, here's what annularity looked like. Almost a perfect ring. So this is an annular eclipse again, and we went to Reunion Island you know, off of the you know, east of Madagascar. And uh, you know, so this is marching around the island, you know, taking a look at things. And what was interesting was we went to see the volcano here, and a couple of days after we left, the volcano erupted. This is just, you know, barging around. Okay, you can see there's another bike. Now there's a little bit more. Now you can start to see solar, you know, some uh, sunspots and stuff. Oh, you know, here's what the eclipse annually they look like there. Again, almost a perfect frame. And you can start to see you know, some more of those Bailey's beads. And after that, we went to, um, you know, it's a place called the, uh, you know, Victoria Falls, and we saw some things. There's a wild elephant, a hippopotamus in the middle of nowhere. Next thing, we, one of the next things we did was we went to up to this one. This is a place called Bakungo. What cart? What continent are we on now? Uh, South America, and you can see here's some more Bailey's beads. You now the things everybody likes to take pictures of. Went to the Solar uh, Observatory in uh, Madurai, India. And uh, it started out reasonably well, and then the clouds moved in. So we take the filters off and do the clouds, and you can see there's the Bailey's beads again. So we this went is, to uh, this is uh, the you know the recent the uh, annual solar eclipse uh, you know from this is close to uh, you know, Monument Valley okay and uh, we'll get to the end of this and you can see you know, yep yep that's close and this was the start and you can see again we have some sunspots and everything. Robert, are you are you familiar with the HamSci uh, Ham Radio uh, Ionospheric Physics Group and their research on uh, eclipses? 
No. Okay, well, there's a group. Uh, it's actually based out of uh, the University of Scranton, uh, but uh, it's a NSF-funded group uh, that's researching uh, solar eclipse uh, eclipses and their effect on the ionosphere, uh, specifically things like uh, uh, the fact that the ionosphere uh, 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 drops and rate uh, and rises, uh, causing uh, Doppler shift uh, in the HF bands uh, during this time, similar to the day versus night. Uh, effect that that occurs every day, and uh, there, it's it's a very interesting uh, work. And I saw you've collected quite a few um, visits to both annular and, of course, uh, I assume also total eclipses. And uh, uh, this is it, it's uh, it's a fairly interesting area. I would urge you to uh, look directly at. Um, uh, Hamsci, H-A-M-S-C-I dot O-R-G. Um, and uh, you'll see a lot of their work. And this is a great that. advertisement too for the Dallas uh, meeting that we're going to have in April because uh, this is the type of thing you should be able to see there. And maybe we look forward to seeing you come to that. You're probably wondering why I go to, you know, take images of annular solar eclipses. Because what I do is during total eclipses, uh, you know, if you take a look at the, you know, the moon going in front of the sun, what happens is the sun's disk is up, you know, uh, you know, occulted, and what we end up with is all of the Fraunhofer series that you see all over the place is reduced to, you know, several wavelengths, you know, like uh, iron 10, iron 14, calcium K, and a couple of others. And what I do is I have a high resolution spectrograph. And I take images of the sun during total eclipses, and I have the software to analyze, uh, you know, what the, you know, what those, uh, you know, spectrums are. You know, it's a flash spectrum, and my, uh, you know, spectrometer is being you know, changed to where it has a slit, so I can do a scan at particular wavelengths. And in the past, I have, uh, you know, taken, uh, you know, you know, very uh, expensive filters in H, you know, in the iron 10 and iron 14. And I have the uh, off-axis, you know, off-wavelength filters, so that I can do the analysis of the contribution of iron ten and iron fourteen to the, uh, you know, to the, uh, you know, sun's coronium, you know, or not coronium, but the, you know, uh, the actual, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, whatever. So I, as, you, as I stumble along, I'm not used to doing this. You know, my my problem is, is you know, do I do things or do I present things? And most of the time I do things as opposed to presenting them. Okay. So, but I've been doing this since like 19, uh, oh, 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 1992 when I went to Hawaii. And I think I've, uh, you know, you know, whatever, it doesn't really matter. You know, you know, okay. So what kind of questions do you guys have? Because I don't know what you want to know. I, I use going to these annual eclipses because one, I love to travel. Okay. And, uh, you know, you know, after, you know, after all of these places, we go to, you know, like Victoria Falls and the Glossy Falls. And, uh, you know, after uh, you know, the total eclipse, uh, you know, from uh, La Serena in South America a couple of years ago, we went off and we did swimming with the sharks at, uh, you know, Galapagos Island. You know, and, uh, you know, you know uh, one interesting thing is, oh, gee, we went to an eclipse on Easter Island. There's another eclipse coming up soon. Okay. And, um, you know, yeah, thanks for the link to the, uh, you know, to the other place. But uh, normally what I do is I travel with, uh, you know, people from, uh, you know, uh, you know the American Astronomical Society, you know, the head of the solar route. You know, uh, he died a couple, you know, for a year and a half ago. But, uh, you know, I, I traveled with Jay Pasikoff and, uh, you know, and, uh, he you know, did a lot of science, among other things. So, so what questions would you ask about uh, an annual solar eclipse? What's important about it? I have a question. It's kind of, it's a bit off topic. I was told by a guy that um, animals will respond to an eclipse like dogs howling. And he really seemed to believe that it was true. Have you ever noticed that? 
what I have experienced is that, you know, the, the birds will think of sunset, you know, and the birds will, you know, go and land. I haven't heard dogs, uh, you know, you know, howling. Um, you know, I just, you know, just know that animals just seem to go quiet into, you know, like into the night. You know, and that was, uh, you know, that was an experience at the, uh, you know, the House of Lorenzo, Greece, that, you know, eclipsed, you know, 20 years ago. And I don't know, and uh, from one of the eclipses in, uh, you know, South a South Africa, uh, South Australia, at, uh, you know, Seduna, you know, you know, you know, 2002, I don't remember dogs howling and all that kind of stuff. I just remember, you know, animals going quiet. Yeah. Yes, we can, yeah, it's question but I know you know uh, at uh, you know Cafe Lorenzo you know uh, you know everybody was told oh don't play music don't do this do that we want to hear what's going on and uh, you know nothing really happened there I hope that answers your question all right thanks uh let's uh we only got a few more minutes here uh so uh excellent work Robert uh we'd love to okay, see you one, one more comment the, the antenna and the, all that stuff, uh, you know, to make uh, the, the next, uh, you know, part of the interferometer, they're on their way and they'll be here soon. So, <laughs> all right. All okay. Right. I'm Bridge. done. Thank you. All right. Who just, uh, go ahead. Oh, uh, Steve Black. Go ahead, Steve. I, uh, we finally did get the rim shield installed on the uh, three meter dish. And it uh, made a tremendous difference in shielding the side lobes from the cell tower. And if I do a share screen here, I can show it attached. Th there it is uh, with... Uh, it's uh about it's using standard wires two feet high and the uh let's see here if i uh is that something of a counterweight that white pipe in the back yeah that was that's extra counterweight i added um uh, it's it's a uh schedule 40 pvc tube with caps on the end uh filled with uh, steel shot that's impressive yeah. how much does yeah. that uh, drop the background noise uh it did not affect the noise floor at all but uh previous well the cell towers are at about uh 150 degree in uh, azimuth and if I got below 240, I started to see spurs uh, due to the cell tower. Now it can easily go down to, oh, 200 degree. Uh, there seems to be another source uh, between 190 and 200 that uh, is bad. But then if you go below, if you go from 180 down towards 150, uh, you still get a good signal. There's some, uh, a few spurs start to show up on the lower end of the pass band. Uh, I think it was yesterday I uh, elevated it to 50 degree and just kept testing in 10 degree steps. And even at 150 degree, which was uh, basically right pointing above the cell towers, uh, the noise floor came up oh just a tad bit uh the spurs uh at the lower end of the at the band uh became more significant so in essence it made the whole sort of western south and western part of the sky uh workable tell us what's okay. on the left it almost looks like a white hat almost like carpet oh, wrapped around oh that's the uh uh, that that's actually an aluminum can uh and inside that aluminum can are the uh is the uh, uh cavity uh, bandpass filter and the lna and since kansas sun gets quite hot and all that i use some uh really sticky uh 
spray foam designed for filling cracks. And, and so that white thing you see is actually uh, foamed over the uh, can. So that's a form of insulation. Yes. And, it, and because it's kind of white and it's insulation, that helps to reduce that temperature up there in the electronic can. Okay. Yeah, and you can see if you look carefully on the, on the right-hand side where it's uh, sort of the right-hand end that's p part of the actually the end cap of the uh, cavity, uh, there's big holes in it, which allows for some circulation too. I noticed when we were working out there the other day, uh, to protect the foam, it's supposed to be UV resistance, but resistant, but I uh, primed it and then spray painted it white. Uh, there seems to be big, some chunks appearing out of the foam. I get, we guess that maybe some birds are liking to peck on it. I'm saying that's a great place for wasp nests too to, to be developed. Nesting materials. Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen anything yet inside the can at all. I think maybe it gets a little, possibly a little too warm for them in the sunshine. Now, let's see if I can. Who's got, who's left? Oh, I got some uh, comments. Anybody else? Go Is ahead. Okay. Uh, I've been uh, doing some uh, you know, work with uh, 20 megahertz watching for solar flares in Jupiter with a single shortened dipole. Got one thoroughly confirmed Jupiter events and a lot of them that are very maybe. Uh, quite a few solar events. But anyway, that's a single and I'm wanting to go to a second dipole. And I started measuring out where I wanted to put the second dipole and realized there is an electric wire and a pipe running out of ground underground there to an outbuilding, not a good place to drive in ground rods and other such things. So uh, the way I found where the wires were running, I had this old gizmo from uh, years ago, uh, electric uh, you know, wireless fence for the dog. And yeah, you run a, a loop of wire around the property and the dog has a little radio you know, collar and gets a little shock if they get close to it. And that hadn't been in use for years. So I ran the the loop out through the ground wire or the electrical wire going to the outbuilding. From the outbuilding, I ran an extension cord over and took the ground prong off of it. An alligator clipped it, wired it to the outside of a coax cable to another antenna, got that back to my radio shack thing, and then drove that from this uh, thing that drives the radio fence that would normally keep the dog in. Lo and behold, that works. I got a signal. So then I walked all around and found where I could get the signal from the ground there and got a nice straight line exactly yeah, where the pipe was and uh, yeah, told me where it was safe to uh, drive in ground rods and things. But uh, one thing I did to kind of forget about this, it gives a warning beep before it you know, shocks your dog. Well, I had it in my hand the wrong way one time and I got lit up good. So now I know what the dog that we had put up with. But anyway, so that's a story for what I'm up to there is I finally know exactly where the wire runs and, uh, you know, drove in the post and ground rod for the second antenna. Okay, um, anybody else? All right, uh, thank you very much, everybody. And um, the next uh, notice will come out will be uh, 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 Drake's Lounge Australia. Okay, I'm sorry I couldn't get to everybody else, but uh, uh, thanks very much and uh, have a good uh, rest of the week. Good uh, Thanksgiving. <laughs>